Okay, so we are recording. I am now recording now. Alright. Last we left off in Looking for Alaska was, um, a lot of things happened. Uh, Pudge went on a date, sort of. He threw up on date. Um, he got a concussion. Uh, there was just a lot of things and a lot of chapters that happened. Hmm. But yes, let's continue on with the book. Let me see how much I want to read today. I think that's a good place to end off that. Maybe not. I'm not sure. But let's keep on going. All right. So the next chapter in this book uh, is respectively called 84 Days Before. Three days later, the rain, the rain began. My head still hurt, and the sizable knot above, above my left temple looked, the colonel thought, like a miniaturized topographical map of Macedonia, which I had not previously known was a place, let alone a country. And as the colonel and I walked over to the, uh, and as the colonel and I walked over the parched, dead, half dead grass that. Monday, that Monday, I said. I suppose we could use some rain. And the colonel looked up at the low clouds coming in fast and threatening, and then he said, Well, use it or not, we're sure as, we're sure as shit, uh, yeah, well, use it or not, we're sure as shit going to get some. And we sure as shit did. Twenty minutes into French class, Madame O'Malley was conjugating the word to believe to the, sub the subjunctive. Que je crois, crois something. Sorry, French people. I, I do not know French. So I'm doing the best I can. Que je, que je crois, que tu crois. Kili o ke quele croy. Uh, she said it over and over, like it wasn't a verb so much as a Buddhist mantra. Keje croy, kete, ketu, ketu croy, kili, kili, kil o quel, uh, croy. What a funny thing to say over and over again. I would, be, I would believe you. I, I would believe you. You would believe. He or she would believe. Believe what? I thought. And right then, the rain came. It came. <coughs> it came all at once and in a furious torrent. Like God was mad and wanted to, and wanted to flood us out. Day after day, night after night, it rained. It rained so that I couldn't see across the dorm circle, so that the lake swelled up and lapped against the uh, deer and deck's wing, swallowing half of the fake beach. By the third day, I abandoned my umbrella entirely and walked around the, and walked around in a perpetual state of of wetness. Everything at the cafeteria tasted like the minor acid of rainwater, and everything stank of mildew when showers became ludicrously inappropriate because the whole goddamn world had better water pressure than the showers. And the rain made hermits of us, 
and the rain made hermits of us all. The colonel spent every nod in class moment sitting on the couch, reading the almanac and playing video games. And I wasn't sure whether he wanted to talk or whether he just wanted to sit on the white foam and drink his ambry, ambrosia in peace. After the, disaster, after the disaster that was our date, I felt it best not to speak to Lara under any circumstances, lest I suffer a concussion or, and or an attack of puking, even though she told me in pre-calc the next day that it was no big, no big deal. Then, and then, and I saw Alaska only in class and could never talk to her because she came to every class late and left the moment the bell rang. Before I could even cap my pen and close my notebook. On the fifth, yeah, on the fifth evening of the rain, I walked into the cafeteria fully prepared to go back to my room and eat a reheated burrito for dinner if Alaska and or Takumi weren't eating. I knew full well the colonel was in room 43, dining on milk and vodka, but I stayed because I saw Alaska sitting alone, her back to the rain-streaked window. I grabbed a heaping plate of fried okra and sat down next to her. God, it's like it'll never end, I said, referring to the rain. Indeed, she said. Her wet hair hung from her head and mostly covered her face. I ate some, she ate some. Have you been? Yeah, have you been? I finally asked. I'm not really up for answering any questions that start with how, when, where, why, or what. What's wrong? I asked. That's a what. I'm not doing any, I'm not doing what's right now. All right, I should go. She pursed her lips and exhaled slowly, like the way the colonel blew out smoke. What? Then I stopped myself and reworded. Did I do something? I asked. She gathered her tray and stood up before answering. Of course not, sweetie. Of course not, sweetie. Her sweetie felt condescending, not romantic. Like a boy enduring his first biblical rainstorm couldn't possibly understand her, pro her problems, whatever they were. It took, it took a sincere effort not to roll my eyes at her, though she couldn't have even, she wouldn't have even noticed if she walked out of the cafeteria with her drippy, with her hair dripping over her face. That is the end of that chapter. The next chapter is called 76 Days Before. I feel better, the colonel told me on the ninth day of the rainstorm as he sat down next to me in religion class. I had an epiphany. Do you remember, do you remember that night when she came to the room and was a complete and total bitch? <sighs> yeah, the opera, the flamingo tie, right. What about it? I asked. The colonel pulled out a spiral notebook, the top half of which was soaking wet, and, and slowly pulling the pages apart until he found his place. That was the epiphany. She's a complete and total bitch. Hyde hobbled in, leaning heavily on a black crate on a black cane. Uh, as he made his way toward as he made his way toward his chair. He dryly noted, My trick knee is warning me that we might have some, have some rain, so prepare yourselves. He stood in front of his chair, leaned back cautiously, grabbed it with both hands, and collapsed into the chair with a series of quick, shallow breaths, like a woman in labor. Although it isn't due for more than two months, you'll be receiving your paper topic for the semester today. Now, I'm quite sure that you've all read the syllabus for this class with such frequency and seriousness that by now you've committed it to memory. He smirked. But a reminder, this paper is 50% of your grade. I encourage you to take it seriously. Now, about this Jesus fellow. 
I talked about the Gospel of Mark, which I hadn't read until the day before. Although I was a Christian, I, although I was a Christian, I guess. I guess. I had been, I had been to church, uh, like, four times, which is more frequently than I had been to a mosque or a, sy or a synagogue. He told us that the first, he told us that in the first century, around the day, around the time of Jesus, some of the Roman coins had a picture of the Emperor Augustus on them, and that beneath his picture were inscribed the words, Filius Dei. Yeah. Yeah, Filius Dei. The Son of God. We are not speaking, he said of a time in which gods had sons. It is not so unusual to be a son of God. The miracle, at least, in that time and in that place, that was Jesus, a peasant, a Jew, and nobody in an empire ruled exclusively by somebodies. That the son of that God, the all-powerful God of Abraham and Moses, that God's son was not an emperor not even a trained rabbi, a peasant and a Jew, a nobody like you. Well, the Buddha was special because he abandoned his wealth and noble birth to seek enlightenment. Jesus was special because he lacked wealth and noble birth, but inherited the ultimate nobility, king of kings. Class over. You can pick up a copy of your final exam on the way out. Stay dry. It wasn't until I stood up to leave that I noticed Alaska had skipped class. How could she skip the only class? How could she skip the only class worth attending? I grabbed a copy of the of the of the final for her. The final exam. What is the most important question human beings must ask, must answer? Choose your question wisely, then examine how Islam, Buddhism, and Christianity and attempt to answer it. I hope that poor bastard lives the rest of the school year, the colonel said as we jogged home through the rain. Because I'm sure, because I'm sure, yeah, because I'm sure to start, because I'm sure, okay. Because I'm sure starting to enjoy that class. What's your most important question? About 30 seconds running, I was already winded. What? What happens to us when we die? Christ, Pudge, if you don't stop running, you're gonna find out. He slowed to a walk. My question is, why do good people get rotten li lots in life? Holy shit, is that Alaska? She was running at us at full speed and she was screaming, but I can hear her over the pounding rain until she was close enough, until she was close to us that I could see her spit flying. The fuckers flooded my room. They ruined like a hundred of my books. Goddamn pissing when weekday warrior shit. Colonel, they just poked a hole in the gutter and connected a plastic tube from the gutter, down to my back window, into my room. The whole place is soaking wet. My copy of the general and the general and his labyrinth is completely ruined. That's pretty good. The colonel said, like an artist admiring another another's work. Hey, she shouted. Sorry, don't worry, dude. He said, God will punish the wicked, and before he does. We will. That is the end of that chapter. Now we go on to the next chapter. And that one is called 67 Days Before. So this is how Noah felt. You wake up one morning and God has forgiven you and you walk around squinting all day because you've forgotten how sunlight feels. You've forgotten how sunlight feels warm and rough against your skin like a kiss on the cheek from your dad. And the whole world is brighter and cleaner than ever before. Like, central Alabama has been put in the washing machine for two weeks and cleaned with extra 
Secret strength detergent with color brightener. And now the grass is greener and the burritos and the burritos are crunchier. I stayed by the classrooms that morning, lying on my stomach in the newly dry grass in the newly dry grass and reading for American history, the Civil War, or as it was known around these parts, the war between the states. To me, it was the war that spawned a thousand good last words, like General Albert Sidney Johnson, who, when asked if he was injured, answered, yes, and I fear seriously, or Robert E. Lee, who many years after the war was, who many years after the war, in a dying delirium announced, strike the tent. I was mulling over. I was mulling over why the Confederate generals had better last words than the Union ones. Ulysses S. Grant's last words, "Water," was pretty lame. When I noticed a shadow blocking me from the sun. Uh, yeah, I was mulling over why the Confederate the Confederate generals had better last words than the Union ones. Ulysses Ulysses S. Grant's last word. Water was pretty lame when I noticed a shadow blocking me from the sun. It had been some time since I had seen a shadow, and it startled me a bit. I looked up. I brought you a snack, Takumi said, dropping an oatmeal ice cream pie onto my book. Very nutritious, I, I smiled. You've got your oats, you've got your meal, you've got your cream. It's a fucking food pyramid. Hell yeah, it is. And then I didn't know what to say. Takumi knew a lot about hip hop. I knew a lot about last words in video games. Finally, I said, I can't believe those guys flooded Alaska's room. Yeah, Takumi said, not looking at me. Well, they had their reasons. You have to understand that with like everybody, even the weekday warriors, Alaska is famous for pranking. I mean, last year we put a Volkswagen Beetle in the library. So if they have any reason to try and one-up her, they'll try. And that's pretty ingenious to divert water from the gutter to her room. I mean, I don't want to admire it. I laughed. Yeah, that will be tough, tough to top. I unwrapped the cream pie and and bit it into it. Hmm. Hundreds of cal- hundreds of delicious calories per bite. She'll think of something, he said. Pudge, he said. Hmm? Hmm. Pudge, you need a cigarette. Let's go for a walk. I felt nervous, as I invariably do when someone says my name twice with a hmm in between. Hold on just one second. Okay. Yeah, I felt nervous, as I invariably do when someone says my name twice with a hmm in between. So I got up, leaving my books behind, and walked toward the smoking hole. But as soon as we got to the edge of the woods, Takumi turned away from the dirt road. Oh yeah, Uh, but I got up leaving my books behind, and walked toward the smoking hall. But as soon as we got to the edge of the woods, Takumi turned away from the dirt road. Not sure the hole is safe, he said. Not safe, I thought. It's the safest place to smoke a cigarette in the known universe. But I just followed him through the thick brush, weaving through pine trees. What the heck? I muted this. Oh, it's just Facebook.
Um, but, but I just followed him through the thick brush, weaving through pine trees and threatening, and threatening chest-high brambly bushes. After a while, he just sat down. I cupped my hand over my lighter to protect the flame from the slight breeze and lit up. Alaska ratted, ratted out Maria, he said, so the eagle might know about the smoking hole too. I don't know. I've never seen him down that way, but who knows what she told him. Wait, how do you know? I asked dubiously. Well, for one thing, I figured, I figured it out. And for another, Alaska admitted it. She told me at least part of the truth, that right, that right at the end of the of the school of the, that right at the end of school last year, she tried to sneak off campus one night after lights out to go visit Jake, and then got busted. Then she was careful. She said she was careful, no headlights or anything. But the eagle caught her, and she had a bottle of wine in her car, so she was fucked. Then the eagle took her into her, into his house and gave her the same offer he gives to everyone when they get fatally busted. Either tell me everything you know or go to your room and pack up your stuff. So Alaska broke and told him that Maria and Paul were drunk and in her room right then. And then she told him God knows what else. And so the eagle let her go because he needs rats to do his job. She was smart really, to rat on one of her friends, because no one ever thinks to blame the friends. That's why the colonel is so sure it wasn't Kevin and his boys. I didn't believe it could be Alaska. Yeah, I didn't believe it could be Alaska either, until I figured out that she was the only person on campus. He would have known what Mario was doing. I suspected Paul's roommate. Long well, long well one of the guys who pulled the armless mermaid bit on you. Turns out he was at home that night. His aunt had died. I checked the obit, I checked the obit on, in the paper. Hollis Furnace Chase. Hell of a name for a woman. So the, con so the colonel doesn't know? I asked, stunned. I put out my cigarette, even though I wasn't quite finished, but e even though I wasn't quite finished, because I felt spooked. I'd never, I never, I'd never suspected Alaska to be this loyal. Moody, yes, but not a rat. No, and he can't know, because he'll go crazy and get her expelled. The colonel takes all this honor and loyalty shit pretty seriously, if you haven't noticed. I've noticed. Takumi shook his head, his hands pushing aside leaves to dig into the still wet dirt beneath. I just don't get why she'd be so afraid of getting expelled. I'd hate to get expelled, but you have to take your lumps. I don't get it. Well, she obviously doesn't like home. <clears throat> True. She only goes home she only she only goes home over Christmas and the summer when Jake is there. But whatever. I don't like home either. But I'd never give the eagle the satisfaction. Takumi picked up a twig and dug it into the soft red dirt. Listen, Pudge. I don't know what kind of prank Alaska and the Colonel are going to come up with to end this. But I'm sure we'll both be involved. I'm, sh I'm telling you all this so you can know you could know what you're getting your what you're getting into because if you got caught you had better take it i thought of florida of my school friends and realized for the first time how much i would miss the creek if i ever had to leave it i stared down at takumi's twig sticking erect out of the mud and said i swear to god i won't rat i finally understood that day at the jury Alaska wanted to show us that she that we could trust her. Survival at, Cur at Culver Creek meant loyalty, and she had ignored that. But then she showed me the way. She and the colonel had taken the fall for me to show me how it was done, so I would know what to do when the time came. 
That is the end of that chapter. On to the next chapter, which, which is called, hold on, let me take a swig of water. Okay, the next chapter is called 58 Days Before. About a week later, I woke up at 6.30, 6.30 on a Saturday to the sweet melody of decapitation, automatic gunfire blasted out above the menacing, bass-heavy background music of the video game. I rolled over and saw Alaska pulling the controller up to the right, as if it would help her escape certain death. I had the same bad habit. Can you at least mute it? Hutch! She said, faux condescending. The sound is an, integ an integral part of the artistic experience of this video game. Muting decapitation would be like reading only every other word of Jane Eyre. The colonel woke. The colonel woke up about a half half an hour ago. He seemed a little annoyed, so I told him to go sleep in my room. Maybe I'll join him, I said groggily. Rather than answering my question, she remarked. So I heard Takumi told you. Yeah, I read it I read it out, Maria, and I'm sorry, and I'll never do it again. In other word in other word yeah, in other news, are you staying here for Thanksgiving? Because I am. I rolled back toward the wall and pulled the comforter over my head. I didn't know whether to trust Alaska, and, I, and I'd certainly had enough of her unpredictability. Cold one day, sweet the next, irresistibly flirty one moment, resistibly obnoxious the next. I preferred the colonel. At least when he was cranky, he had a reason. In a testament to the power of fatigue, I managed to fall asleep quickly convinced that the shrieking of dying monsters and Alaska's delighted squeals upon killing them were nothing more than a pleasant soundtrack to wit by which to dream. I woke up half an hour later and she sat down when she sat down on my bed, her butt against my lips. Her underwear, her jeans, the comforter, my corduroys, and my boxers between us, I thought. Five layers, and yet I felt it the nervous warmth of touching, a pale reflection of the fireworks of one mouth on another, but a reflection nonetheless. And in the most, and in the almost, yeah, and, yeah, and in the almostness of the moment, I cared at least, I cared at least enough. I wasn't sure whether I liked her, and I doubted whether I could trust her, but I cared at least enough to try and find out. Her on my bed, wide green eyes staring down at me, the enduring mystery of her sly, almost smirking smile. Five layers between us. She continued as I hadn't been asleep. She continued as if I hadn't been asleep. Jake has to study, so he doesn't want me in Nashville. Says he can't pay attention to music musicology while staring at me. I said I could wear a burqa, but he wasn't convinced, so I'm staying here. I'm sorry, I said. Oh, don't be. I'll have loads to do. There's a prank to plan, but I was thinking you should stay here too. In fact, I have composed a list. A list? She reached into her pocket and pulled out a heavily folded piece of notebook paper and began to read. Why Pudge Should Stay at the Creek for Thanksgiving, a list by Alaska Young. One, because he is very conscientious, because he is a very conscientious student, Pudge has been deprived of many wonderful Culver Creek experiences, including, including, but not limited to, A, drinking wine with me in the woods, and B, getting up early on a Saturday to eat breakfast at Mick and, Mick and Edible, and then driving through the greater Birmingham area, smoking cigarettes and talking about how pathetically boring the greater Birmingham area is, and also see 
going out late at night and lying on in the dewy soccer field and reading a Kurt and reading a Kurt Vonnegut book by moonlight. Two, although she certainly does not excel at endeavors such as teaching the French language, Madame O'Malley makes a mean stuffing and she invites all the students who stay on campus for Thanksgiving, uh, who stay on campus to Thanksgiving dinner, which is usually just me and the South Korean exchange student. But whatever, Pudge would be welcome. Three, I don't really have a three, but one and two were awfully good. One and two appeal to me, certainly, but most mostly I like the, the but mostly I like the idea of just her and just her and just me on campus. I'll talk to my I'll talk to my parents once they wake up, I said. She coaxed me onto the couch and we played decapitation together until she abruptly dropped the controller. I'm not flirting, I'm just tired, she said, kicking off her flip flops. Uh she pulled her feet on yeah, she pulled her feet onto the the foam couch, tucking them behind a cushion, then scooted up, and then and scooted up, uh yeah, and scooted up to put her head on my lap. My corduroys, my boxers, two layers. I could feel the warmth of her cheek on my thigh. There are times when it is appropriate, even preferable, to get an interrupt to get an erection when someone's face is in close proximity to your penis. This was not one of those times. So I stopped thinking about the layers and the warmth, muted the TV, and focused on decapitation. At 8.30, I turned off the game and scooted it out from underneath Alaska. She turned onto her back, still asleep, the lines of my corduroy pants imprinted on her cheek. I usually called... I usually only call my parents on Sunday afternoons, so when my mom heard my voice, she instantly overreacted. What's wrong, Miles? Are you okay? I'm fine, Mom. I'm fine, Mom. I think. If it's okay with you, I think I might stay here for Thanksgiving. A lot of my friends are staying. Why? And I have a lot of work to do. Double why. I had no idea how hard the classes would be. Yeah, I had no idea how hard the classroom classes would be, Mom. True. Oh, sweetie, we miss you so much. And there's a big Thanksgiving turkey... Thanksgiving turkey waiting for you. And all the cranberry sauce you can eat. I hated cranberry sauce. But for some reason, my mom persisted in her lifelong belief that it was my very favorite food. And even though every single Thanksgiving, I politely declined to include it on my plate. Yeah, even though every single uh, Thanksgiving, I politely declined to include it on my plate. I know, Mom. I miss you guys, too. But I really want to do well here. True. And plus, it's really nice to have, like, friends. True. I knew that playing the friend card would sell her on the idea, and it did. So I got her blessing to stay on campus after promising to hang out with them for every minute of Christmas break, as if I had other plans. I spent the morning at the computer. Uh, hold on. Yeah, I spent the nor I spent the morning at the computer, flipping back and forth between my religion and English papers. There were only two weeks of classes before exams the coming one and the one after Thanksgiving. And so far, the best personal answer I had to what happens to people after they die was, well, something, maybe. The Colonel came in at noon. His thick uber math book cradled in his arms. I just saw Sarah, he said. How'd that work out for you? Bad. She said she still loved me. God, I love you is real, really is the gateway drug of breaking up. Saying I love you while walking across the dorm circle inevitably leads to saying I love you while you're doing it. So I just bolted. I laughed. He pulled, 
He pulled out a notebook and sat down at his at his desk. Yeah, ha ha. So Alaska said you're staying here. Yeah. I feel a little guilty about ditching my parents though. Yeah, well, if you're staying here in hopes of making out with Alaska, I sure wish you wouldn't. If you unmoor her yeah, if you unmoor her from the rock that is Jake, God have mercy on us all. That would be some drama, indeed. And as a rule, I like to I like to avoid drama. It's not because I want to make out with her. Hold on. He grabbed a pencil and scrawled and scrawled excitedly at the paper as if he just made a mathematical breakthrough and then looked up back at me. I just did some calculations, and I've been able to turn. Yeah, I just did some calculations, and I've been able to determine that you're full of shit. And he was right. How could I abandon? How could I abandon my parents, who were nice enough to pay for my education at Culver Creek? My parents, who had always loved me, just because I maybe liked some girl with a boyfriend. How could I leave them alone with a giant turkey and mounds of an edible cranberry sauce? So during third period, period, I called my mom at work. I wanted to, I wanted her to say it was okay, I guess, for me to stay at the creek for Thanksgiving. But I didn't quite expect her to excitedly tell me that she and dad had bought plane tickets to England immediately after I called and were planning to spend Thanksgiving in a castle on their second honeymoon. Oh, that's awesome, I said, and then quickly got off the phone because I did not want to hear, and because I did not want her to hear me cry. I guess Alaska heard me slam down the phone from her room because she opened the door as I walked away, but said nothing. I walked across the dorm circle and then straight through the soccer field, and then straight through the soccer field, bushwhack, bushwhacking through the woods until I ended up on the banks of Culver Creek, just down by the br just down from the bridge. I sat, with my, I sat with my butt on the rock and my feet in the dark. Yeah, I sat with my butt on a rock and my feet in the dark dirt of the, of the creek bed and tossed pebbles into the clear, shallow water. And they landed with an empty plop, barely audible over the rumbling of the creek as it danced its way south. Hold on. Yeah, as it down as it dances its way south. The light filtered through the leaves and kind of sorry. <sighs> Damn. Yeah, the light filtered Yeah, the light filtered through the leaves and the pine needles above as if, as if her lace, the ground spotted, in, the ground spotted in shadow. I thought of the one thing about home that I missed. My dad's study with its built-in floor-to-ceiling shelves, sagged with thick biographies, and the black leather chair, and the black leather chair that kept me just uncomfortable enough to keep from feeling sleepy as I read it, as I read. It was stupid to feel as upset as I did. I pitched them, and it felt the other way around. Still, I felt unmistakably homesick. I looked up toward the, I looked up toward the bridge and saw Alaska sitting on one of the blue chairs at the smoking hole. And though I, and though I thought I had wanted to be alone, I found myself saying, "Hey, then." When she did not turn to me, I screamed, Alaska! Alaska! She walked over. I was looking for you, she said, joining me on the rock. Hey. I'm really sorry, Pudge, she said, and put her, and put her arms around me, resting her head against my shoulder. It occurred to me that she didn't even know what happened, but she still sounded sincere. What am I going to do? You'll spend Thanksgiving with me, silly. Here. 
So why don't you go home for vacations? I asked her. I'm just scared of ghosts, Pudge. And the home and home is full of them. And that is the end of that chapter. I will be right back. It won't take me long. Okay, sorry about that. All right. <clears throat> now we are on to the next, to the next, um, chapter, which is called 52 Days Before. After everyone left, after the colonel's mom showed up in a beat-up hatchback, and he threw his giant duffel bag into the back seat, and after he said, I'm not much for saying goodbye. I'll see you in a week. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And after a green limousine picked arrived for Laura, whose father was the only doctor in some small town in southern Alabama, and after I joined Alaska on a harrowing, we don't need to do, we don't need no stinking breaks drive, the airport to drop off to Kumi, and after the camp is settled into an eerie quiet with no door with no doors flailing, no music playing, and no one laughing, and no one screaming, after all that, we made our way to the soccer field, and she took me to the edge of the field where the woods start. The same steps I'd walk, the same sex, the same steps I'd walk on my way to being thrown into the lake. Beneath the full moon, she cast a shadow, and you could see the curve of her waist to her hips in the shadow. And after a while, she stopped and said, Dig. And I said, Dig? And she said, Dig. And we went on like that for a bit. And then I got on my knees. <sighs> Excuse me. And then I got on my knees and dug through the soft black dirt at the edge of the woods. And before I could get very far, my fingers scratched glass, 
and I dug around the glass until I pulled out a pink, until I pulled out a bottle of pink wine, Strawberry Hill, it was called. I suppose because it had not tasted like vinegar with a dash of maple syrup, it might have act, it might have tasted like strawberries. I have a fake ID, she said, but it sucks. So every time I go to the liquor store, I try to dent, I try to buy ten bottles of this and some vodka for the colonel. So and so when it finally works, I'm covered for a semester, and then I give the colonel his vodka and he puts it in wherever he puts it, and I take mine and bury it. Because you're a pirate. Yeah, because you're a pirate, I said. I matey, precisely. Although, wine consumption has risen in a bit this semester, so we'll need to take a trip tomorrow. This is the last bottle. She unscrewed the cap, no corks here, and sipped and handed it to me. Don't worry about the eagle tonight she said. He's just happy most everyone's gone. He's probably masturbating for the first time in a month. I worried about, I worried about it for a moment as I held the bottle by the neck, but I wanted to trust her, and so I did. I took a minor sip, and as soon as I swallowed, I felt my body rejecting the stinging syrup. I felt my body rejecting the stinging syrup of it. It washed back down my it washed back up my esophagus, but I swallowed hard, and there, yes, I did it. I was drinking on campus. So we lay on, so we lay on in the tall grass between the soccer field and the woods, passing the bottle back and forth and tilting our heads up to sip it, sip the wine, the wince-inducing wine. As promised in the list, she brought me a Kurt Van Gogh book, Cat's Cradle and she read aloud to me, her soft voice mingling with the frogs croaking and the grasshoppers landing softly around us. We did not hear her words so much as the cadence of her voice. Oh, let me say that again. I did not hear her words so much as the cadence of her voice. She had obviously read the book many times before, and so she read flawlessly and confidently, and I could hear her smile in the reading of it. And, and the sound of that smile made me think that maybe I would like novels better if Alaska Young read them to me. Then, after, after a while, she put down the book, and I felt warm, but not drunk from the bottle rustling between us. My, tush, my chest touching the bottle, and her chest touching the bottle, but us not touching each other. And then she placed a hand on my leg. Her hand was just above my knee the palm flat and soft against my jeans, and her index finger making slow, lazy circles that crept up toward the inside of my thigh. And with one layer, and with one layer between us, God, I wanted her. And lying there, amid the tall, still grass, and beneath the star-drunk sky, listening to the just this side of an audible sound of her rhythmic breathing and the noisy silence of the bullfrogs, the grasshoppers, the distant cars rushing endlessly on the I-65, I thought it might be a fine time to say the three little words, and I steeled myself to say them as I stared up at that, at that starriest night, convinced myself that she felt it too, that her hand, that her hand so lithe and vivid against my leg was more than playful. And fuck Laura and fuck Jake because I do, Alaska. I do love you. And that and what else matters but and what else matters but that and my lips parted to speak. But and before I could even begin to breathe out the words, she said It's not life or death, the labyrinth. Um okay so what is it? Suffering, she said. Doing wrong and having wrong things happen to you. That's the problem. Bolivar was, Bolivar, yeah, Bolivar was talking about the pain, not about living or dying, not about the living or dying. How do you get out of the labyrinth of suffering? 
What's wrong? I asked, and I felt the absence of her hand on me. Nothing's wrong, but there's always suffering punch. Homework or malaria or having a boyfriend who lives far away when there's a good looking boy lying next to you. Suffering is universal. It's the one thing Buddhists, Christians, and Muslims are all working are all worried about. I turned to her. Oh, so maybe Dr. Hyde's class isn't total bullshit. And both of us lying on our sides. She smiled. Our noses almost touched. My unblinking eyes on hers. Her face blushing from the wine. And I opened my mouth again. But this time, not to speak. And she, re and she reached up and put a finger on my lips and said, Shh, shh, don't ruin it. And that is the end of that chapter. God, he's so in love with her. Like, so in love with her. <laughs> he's horny and he might be in love with her. He definitely likes her. But he might also be in love with her, but also he is very horny. I'll give you that. <laughs> okay. Next chapter is called 51 Days Before. The next morning, I didn't hear the knocking as if there was any, if, uh, yeah. Excuse me. All right, yeah. The next morning, I didn't hear the knocking, if there was any. I just heard, up! Do you know what time it is? I looked at the clock and gravely muttered, it's 7.36. No, Pudge, it's party time. We've only got seven days left before everyone comes back. Oh God, I can't even tell you how nice it is to have you here. Last Thanksgiving, I spent the whole time constructing one massive candle and using the wax from all my little candles. Party time? It's party time. According to Alaska, it is party time. And we shall enjoy party time. Yeah, last Thanksgiving, I spent the whole time constructing one massive candle using the wax from all my little candles. God, it was boring. I counted the ceiling tiles, 37 down, 80, 84 across. Talk about suffering, absolute torture. I'm really tired, I, I said, and then she cut me off. Poor Pudge, oh poor, poor Pudge. Do you want me to climb into bed with you and cuddle? Well, if you're offering, no, up, now. She took, she took me behind a wing of weekday warrior rooms, 50 to 59, and stopped in front of a window, placed her palms flat against it, and pushed up until, until, yeah, until the wind, it went, uh, and pushed up until the window was half open, then crawled inside. I followed. What do you see, Pudge? I saw a dorm room, the same singular, the same cinder block wall, walls, the same dimensions, even the same layout as my, as my own. Their couch was nicer and they had an actual coffee table instead of coffee table. And they had two posters, they had two posters on the wall. One featured a huge stack, stack of $100 bills with the caption, the first million is the hardest. On the opposite wall, a poster of a red Ferrari uh, I see a dorm room. You're not looking, Pudge. When I go into your room, I see a couple of guys who love video games. When I look at my room, I see a girl who loves books. She walked over to the couch and picked up a plastic soda bottle. Look at this, she said, and I saw that it was half filled with a brackish brown, with a brackish brown liquid. Dip spit. So they dip. 
and they obviously aren't hygienic about it. So are they going to care if you pee in their on their toothbrushes? They won't care enough, that's for sure. Look, tell me what these guys love. They love money, I said, pointing to the poster. She threw up her hands, exasperated. They all love money, Pudge. Okay, go into the bathroom. Tell me what you see there. The game was annoying to me. The game was annoying me a little, but I went into the bathroom and she sat down on that inviting couch. Into, inside the shower, I found a dozen bottles of shampoo and conditioner. In the medicine cabinet, I found a cylindrical bottle of something called Rewind. I opened it. The blue shell smelled like flowers and rubbing, alcohol, and rubbing alcohol, like a fancy hair salon. Under the sink, I also found a tub of Vaseline so big that it could have only had one possible use, which I didn't care to dwell on. I came back into the room and excitedly say, said, they love their hair. Precisely, she shouted. Look on the top bunk. Perilous, peris, perilously, yeah, perilously positioned on the thin wooden headboard of, of the bed, a bottle of stap, of stawet, yeah, of stawet gel. Kevin doesn't need to wake up with that. Kevin just, uh, Kevin doesn't just wake up with that spiky bed head look, Pudge. He works for it. He loves that hair. They leave their hair products here, Pudge, because they have duplicates at home. All those boys do. And do you know why? Because they're compensating for their tiny little penises? I asked. <laughs> no, that's why they're macho assholes. They love their hair because they aren't smart enough to love something more interesting. So we hit them where it hurts, the scalp. Okay, I said, unsure of how exactly to prank someone's scalp. Oh, there are tons of ways to prank someone's scalp. Tons of ways. You could put bleach in someone's shampoo. That'll bleach their hair. You could put dye in someone's hair. That'll do something. That'll... You could put jizz in the conditioner. Oh my god. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, you could do that. You could get, um, get a cream that, like, thins out their hair. Stuff like that, man. But, yeah. Uh, okay, I said, unsure of how exactly to prank someone's scalp. She stood up and walked to the window and bent over to shimmy out. Oh my god, yeah, that's genius. There's a lot of things you could do with hair, man. Okay. Yeah, she stood up and walked to the window and bent over her to shimmy out. Don't look at my ass, she said. And so I looked at her ass, spreading, spreading out wide from her thin waist. She effortlessly somersaulted out of a half-open window. I took the feet-first approach, and once I got my feet on the ground, I limboed my upper body out of the window. Well, she said, that looked awkward. Let's go to the smoking hole. She shuffled her feet to, she shuffled her feet to kick up dry orange dirt on the road. Uh, to the bridge, seeming not, seeming not to walk so much as cross, yeah, seeming not, seeming not to walk so much as cross country ski. As we follow, as we followed the almost trail down, yeah, as we followed the almost trail down from the bridge to the hole, she turned around and looked back at me, stopping. I wonder how one would go about requiring, yeah. 
I wonder how one would go about acquiring industrial strength blue dye, she said, and then held a branch, a tree branch back at me. There we go. That's, that's what they're going to do. They're going to dye their hair. That's genius. All right. That's the end of that chapter. The next chapter is, oh, wow. I've read a lot and it's been like, well, I feel like I've read a lot. And it's been like an hour. Nice. Way to go, me. Okay, the next chapter is called 49 Days Before. Two days later, Monday, the real first Monday, the first real day of vacation. I spent the morning working on my religion final and went, and went to Alaska's room in the afternoon. She was reading in bed. Auden she announced. What were his last words? Don't know. Never heard of him. Never heard of him? You poor illiterate boy. Here, read this line. I walked over and looked down at her index finger. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. I read aloud. Yeah, that's pretty good, I said. Pretty good? Sure, and some and some bufritos are pretty good. Sex is pretty fun. The sun is pretty hot. Jesus, it says so much about love and brokenness. It's perfect. Mm-hmm. I nodded. I nodded unenthusiastically. You're hopeless. Wanna go porn hunting? Yeah, wanna go porn hunting? Huh? We can't love our neighbors till we know how crooked their hearts are. Don't you like porn? She said, she asked, smiling. Um, I answered. The truth was that I hadn't seen much porn, and the idea of looking at porn with Alaska had a certain appeal. We started with the 50s wing, yeah, we started with the 50s wing, wing of dorms, and made our way backward around the hexagon. She pushed open the back windows while I looked out and made sure no one was walking by. I'd never been in most people's rooms. After three months, I knew most people, but I regularly talked to very few. Just the colonel in Alaska and Takumi, really. But in a few hours, I got to know my classmates quite well. Wilson Carbot, the center, of, the center for the Culver Creek Nothings, had hemorrhoids. Yeah, had hem hemorrhoids. Or at least he kept hemorrhoidal cream secreted away, uh, secreted away uh, in the bottom drawer of his desk. Chandra, yeah, Chandra Kyler's a cute girl who loved math a little too much and who Alaska believed was the colonel's future girlfriend, collected Cabbage Patch Kids. I don't mean that she collected, I don't mean that she collected Cabbage Patch Kids when she was like five. She collected them now, dozens of them, black, white, Latino, and Asian, and Asian, boys and girls, babies dressed as farmland, babies dressed as farmhands and budding businessmen. A senior weekday warrior named Holly Moser sketched nude self-portraits in charcoal pencil, portraying her rotund form in all of its girth. I was stunned by how many people had booze. Even the weekday warriors who got to go home every weekend had beer and liquor stashed everywhere from toilet tanks to the bottom of dirty clothes hampers. God. I could have ratted out anyone, uh, Alaska said softly, as she unearthed a 40-ounce bottle of magnum malt liquor from Longwell Chase's closet. I wondered then why she had chosen Paul and, and Maria. Alaska found everyone's secrets so fast that I suspected she'd done this before, but she couldn't possibly have had, have had advanced knowledge of the secrets of Ruth and Margaret and Margot Bloster, ninth grade twin sisters who were new and seemed to socialize even less than I did. 
After crawling into the room, Alaska looked around for a moment, then walked into the bookshelf. She stared at it, and then pulled out the King James Bible, and there, a purple bottle of Maui Waui wine cooler. How clever, she said as she twisted off the cap. She drank it down in two long sips, and then proclaimed, Maui Wowee! They'll know you were here, I shouted. My Her eyes widened. Oh no, you're right, Pudge, she said. Maybe they'll go to the Eagle and tell him that someone stole their wine cooler. She laughed and leaned out the window, throwing the empty bottle onto, into the grass. And we found plenty of porn magazines haphazardly stuffed in between mattresses and box springs. It turned out that Hank Walston did like something other than basketball and pot. He liked jugs. But we didn't find a movie until room 32, occupied by a couple of guys from Mississippi named Joe and Marcus. They were in our religion class and sometimes sat with the colonel and me at lunch, but I didn't know them well. Alaska read the sticker on the top of the video. The bitches of Madison County. Well, ain't that just delightful? We ran it, we ran it to the TV room, closed the blinds, locked the door, and watched the movie. It opened with a woman standing on, the, on a bridge with her legs spread, while a guy knelt in front of her, giving her or, oral sex. No time for dialogue, I suppose. By the time they were started doing it, Alaska commenced with her righteous indignation. They just don't make sex look fun for women. The girl is just an object. Look, look at that. I was already looking, needless to say. A woman crouched on her hands and knees while a, while a guy knelt behind her. She kept saying, give it to me, and moaning, and tearful eyes, brown and blank, betrayed her lack of interest. I, could, I couldn't help but take mental notes, Hand on on, hands on her shoulders, I noted. Fast, but not too fast, or it's going to be over fast. Keep your grunting to a minimum. As if reading my mind, she said, God, Pudge, never do it that hard. That would hurt. That looks like torture. And all she can do is just sit there and take it? That is not a man and a woman. It's a penis and a vagina. What's erotic about that? Where's the kissing? Given their position, I don't think they can kiss right now, I noted. That's my point. By virtue of how they're doing it, it's objectification. He can't even see her face. This is what can happen to women, Pudge. That woman is someone's daughter. This is what you do, this is what you make us do for money. Well, not me, I said defensively. I mean, not technically. I don't, like, produce porn movies. Look me in the eye and tell me this doesn't turn you on, Pudge. I couldn't, she laughed. It was fine, she said. Healthy, and then she got up, stopped the tape, lay down on her stomach across the couch, and mumbled something. What did you say? I asked, walking to her, walking to her, putting my hand on the smaller of her back. Shh, she said, I'm sleeping. Just like that, from a hundred miles an hour to asleep in a nanosecond, I wanted so badly to lay down next to her on the couch, to wrap my arms around her and sleep. Not fuck like in those movies, not even have sex, just sleep together in the most innocent sense of the phrase. But I lacked the courage and she had a boyfriend and I was gawky and she was gorgeous and I was hoping, and I was hopelessly boring and she was endlessly fascinating. So I walked to the back of my room and collapsed on the bottom bunk, thinking that if people were rain, I was a drizzle and she was a hurricane. That is the end of that chapter. I think that is like my favorite, favorite line and favorite 
like, no, I think it's just, no, favorite line and favorite four sentences of this entire book. I just love it. It is great. Great writing. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, I've seen that, that line or those, like, couple of, like, sentences, like, floating around, like, as, like, a powerful, like, memorable line or, like, memorable lines of that book. So you now, you know where that's from. Now you know where it's from. Okay. We go now to the next chapter. The next chapter is called <clears throat> Sorry, I'm like trying to adjust myself. I just need to put on. Okay. The next chapter is called 47 Days Before. On Wednesday morning, I woke up with a stuffy nose to an entirely new Alabama, a crisp and cold one. As I walked to Alaska's room that morning, the frosty grass of the dorm room crunched beneath my shoes. I don't run in frost much in Florida, and I jumped up and down like I was stomping a bubble wrap. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Alaska was holding a burning green candle in her hand upside down, dripping the wax onto a larger homemade volcano that looked like that looked a bit like a Technicolor middle school science project volcano. Don't burn yourself, I said as the flame crept up toward her hand. Night falls fast. Today is in the past, she said without looking up. Wait, I've heard that before. What is that? What is that? I said. I asked. With her free hand, she grabbed a book and tossed it toward me. It landed on my feet. Poem, she said. Edna St. Yeah, Edna St. Vincent in the Lay. You've read that. You've read the... Wait. Hold on. Oh, okay. It landed on my feet. Poem, she said. Edna St. Vincent Millay. You've read that? I'm stunned. Oh, I read her, her I read her biography. Didn't have her last words in it, though. I was a little bitter. All I remember is that she had a lot of sex. I know. She's my hero, uh, Alaska said without a trace of irony. I laughed, but she didn't notice. Does it seem at all odd to you that you enjoy biographies of great writers a lot more than you enjoy their actual writing? Nope, I announced. Just because they were interesting people doesn't mean I care to hear their musings on nightmare, on nighttime. It's about, de it's about depression, dumbass. Oh, really? Well, geez, then it's brilliant, I answered. She sighed. All right. The snow may be falling in the winter of my discontent, but at least I've got sarcastic company. Sit down, will ya? 
I sat down next to her with my legs crossed and our knees touching. She pulled a clear... She pulled a clear plastic crate filled with dozens of candles. Yeah, she pulled a clear plastic crate filled with dozens of candles out from underneath her bed. She, she looked at it for a moment, then, hand, then handed me a white one with a lighter. We spent all morning burning candles. Well, and occasionally what lighting cigarettes off the burning candles after we stuffed a towel into the crack of the bottom of her, of her door. Over the course of two hours, we added a full foot to the summit of her polychrome candle volcano. Mount St. Helens on acid, she said. At 12.30, after two hours of me begging for a ride to McDonald's, Alaska decided it was time for lunch. As we began to walk to the student parking lot, I saw a strange car, a small green car, a hatchback. I've seen that color, I thought. Where have I seen the car? And then the colonel jumped out and ran to meet us. Rather than like, I don't know, hello or something, the colonel or something, the colonel began. I have been instructed to invite you to Thanksgiving dinner at Ches Martin. Alaska whispered in my ear, and then I laughed and said, I have been instructed to accept your invitation. So we walked over to the Eagle's house, told him we were going to eat turkey trailer park style, and sped away in the hatchback. The colonel explained to us, the colonel explained it to us that on the two hour car ride south, I was crammed in the back seat because Alaska had, had called shotgun. She usually drove, but when she didn't, she was shotgun calling queen of the world. The colonel's mother heard that we were on campus and couldn't bear the thought of leaving us family-less uh, for Thanksgiving. The colonel didn't seem too keen on the whole idea. I'm going to have to sleep in a tent, he said, and I laughed. Except it turns out he did have to sleep in a tent. A nice four-person green outfit, shaped like half an egg, but still a tent. The, colonel the colonel's mom lived in a trailer, as in the kind of thing you might see attached to a large pickup truck, except this particular one was old and falling apart on its cinder blocks, and probably couldn't have been hooked on and probably couldn't have been hooked up to a truck without disintegrating. It wasn't even a particularly big trailer. I just had barely, I could just barely stand up to my full height without scraping the ceiling. Now I understood why the colonel was short. He couldn't afford to be any taller. The place was really one long room with a full size bed at the front, a kitchenette and a living area in the back with a TV and a small bathroom. So small that in order to take a shower, you pretty much had to sit on the toilet. It ain't much, the Colonel's mom, that's Dolores, not Miss Martin, told us. But y'all's gonna, but y'all's gonna have a turkey the size, oh, uh, but y'all's are gonna have a turkey the size of the kitchen, she laughed. The colonel ushered us out of the trailer immediately after our brief tour, and we walked through the neighborhood, a series of trailers and mobile, home, mobile homes on dirt roads. Well, now I know, well, now I get why you hate rich people. I see, and I did. I couldn't fathom how the colonel grew up in so, such a small place. The entire trailer was smaller than our dorm room. I didn't know what to say to him how to make him feel less embarrassed. I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable, he said. I know it's probably foreign. Not to me, Alaska piped up. Well, you don't live in a trailer, he told her. Poor is poor, I suppose, the colonel said. Alaska decided to go help Dolores with dinner. She said that it had 
She said that it was sexist to leave the cooking to the women, but better to have good sexist food than crappy boy prepared food. So the colonel and I sat on the pull-out couch in the living room, playing video games and talking about school. I finished my religion paper, but I have to type it up on on your computer when we get back. I think I'm ready for finals, which is good, since we have an ink fray to the end play. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm ready for fi finals, which is good, since we have an ink fray to the end to the end play. Your mom doesn't know pig. Your mom doesn't know pig Latin. I smirk. Not if I talk fast. Christ, be quiet. The food, fried okra, steamed corn on the cob, and pot roast that was so tender it felt right. It fell right off the plastic fork. Convinced me that Dolores was an even better cook than Marie. Culver Creek's okra had less grease, more crunch. Dolores was also the funniest mom I'd ever met. When Alaska asked her what she did for work, she smiled and said, I'm a culinary engineer. That's a short order cook. That's a short order cook at the White House. Yeah, I'm a culinary engineer. That's a short order cook at the Waffle House to y'all. Best Waffle House in Alabama, the colonel smiled. And then I realized he wasn't embarrassed of his mom at all. He was just scared that we might act like condescending boarding school snobs. I always found the colonel's I hate the rich routine a little overwrought until I saw him with his mom. He was the same colonel, but in a totally different context and made me hope that one day I could meet Alaska's family too. Dolores insisted that Alaska and I shared the bed and she slept on and she slept on the pull-out couch while, Colonel, while the colonel was out in his tent. I worried, I worried that he would get cold, but frankly, I wasn't about to give up my bed with Alaska. We had separate blankets, but they were free, but they were fewer than three layers between us. But the possibilities kept me up half the night. That is the end of that chapter. Let me take, take a swig of water. Actually, hold on. Give me like a little three minute break or two minute, whatever. Sorry, I'm eating this with you.
Okay. Back at it again. All right. The next chapter. Sorry, I just felt like I needed to get something sweet in me. I had like a really bad sweet tooth. Okay. So, the next chapter is called 46 Days Before. Uh, 46 Days Before. Best Thanksgiving food I've ever had. No crappy cranberry sauce, just huge slabs of moist white meat, corn, green beans cooked in enough bacon fat to make them taste like they weren't good for you biscuits with gravy, pumpkin pie for dessert, and a glass of red wine for each of us. I believe, I believe, Dolores said, that you're supposed to drink white with turkey. But now I don't know about y'all, but I suppose I give a shit. But I don't suppose I give a shit. We, we laughed and drank our wine, and then after the meal, we each listed our gratitudes. My family always did that before the meal. And we all just rushed through to get to the food. So the four of us sat down around the table and shared our blessings. I was thankful for the fine food and fine company and having a home on Thanksgiving. A trailer, at least. Uh, Dolores joked. Okay, my turn, Alaska said. I'm grateful for having just... I'm grateful for having just had my best Thanksgiving in a decade. Then the colonel said, I'm just grateful for you, Mom. And Dolores, and Dolores laughed and said, That dog won't hunt boy. I didn't know exactly what that phrase meant, but apparently it meant that was inadequate because then the colonel expanded his list to acknowledge that he was grateful to be the smartest human being uh, because then the colonel expanded expanded his list to acknowledge that he was he was grateful to be the smartest human being in this trailer park. And Dolores laughed and said, "Good enough." And Dolores, she was grateful that her phone was back on and her boyfriend was home. That Alaska helped to cook and I was and I had kept the colonel out of her hair. That her job was steady and her coworkers were nice that she had a place to sleep and a boy who loved her. I sat in the back of the hatchback on the drive home, and that is how I thought of it, home, and fell asleep to the highway's monotonous lullaby. That is the end of that chapter. Short and sweet. The next chapter is called 44 Days Before. Pusa Liquors' entire business model is built around selling cigarettes to minors and alcohol to adults. Alaska looked at me with disconcerting frequency when she drove, particularly since we were winding through a narrow, hilly highway south of school, headed to the aforementioned, aforementioned yeah, the aforementioned Kusa Liquors. It was Saturday, our last day of real vacation. Which is great if all you need is cigarettes, but we need booze, and they card for booze, and my ID blows, but I'll flirt my way through. She made a, she made a sudden and unsignaled, an unsignaled left turn pulling onto a road that dropped precipitously down a hill with fields on either side, and she gripped the steering wheel tight as we accelerated, and she waited until the last possible moment to break, just before we reached the bottom of the hill. 
There stood a plywood gas station that no longer sold gas with a faded sign bolted to the roof. Kusa Liquors, we cater to your spiritual needs. Alaska went in alone and walked out the door five minutes later, weighed down with two paper bags filled with contraband, three cartons of cigarettes, five bottles of wine, and a fifth of, and a fifth of vodka for the colonel. On the way home, she, Alaska said, You like knock-knock jokes? Knock-knock jokes? I asked. You mean like knock-knock? Who's there? Replied Alaska. Who? Who, who? What are you, an owl? I said. I finished. Lame. That was brilliant, said Alaska. I have one. You start. Okay. Knock. Okay. Knock knock. Who's there? Uh, said Alaska. I looked at her blankly. About a minute later, I got it and laughed. My mom told me that joke when I was six. It's still funny. So I could not have been more surprised when she showed up sobbing at room 43 when I was just putting the finishing touches on my final thing, on my final paper for English. She sat down on the couch, her every exaltation a mix of whimper and scream. I'm sorry, she said, heaving. Snot was dribbling down her, train, her chin. What's wrong? I started. What's wrong? I asked. She picked up Kleenex from the coffee table and wiped out her face. I don't... She started and then a sob came... And then a sob came like a tsunami. Her cry so loud and childlike that it scared me. And I got up, sat down next to her, and put my arm around her. She turned away, pushing her head into the foam of the, of the couch. I don't understand why I screw everything up. She said. What? Like with Maria? What? Like with Maria? Maybe you were just scared. Scared isn't a good excuse. She shouted in, into the couch. Scared is the excuse everyone always... Scared is the excuse everyone has always used. I didn't know who everyone was or when always was, but as much as I wanted to understand her ambiguity, ambiguities, the slyness was growing annoying. Why are you so upset with, about this now? It's not just that. It's everything. But I told the colonel in the car. She sniffed, but seemed done with the sobs. While well, you were sleeping in the back, and he said he could never let me out of his sight during pranks, and he said he, he'd never let me out of his side during pranks. That he couldn't trust me on my own. And I don't blame him. I don't even trust me. It took guts to tell him, I said. I have guts, just not when it counts. Will you, um... And she sat up straight and then moved toward me. And I raised my arms as she collapsed into my... And I raised her arm as she collapsed into my skinny chest and cried. I felt bad for her, but she'd done it to herself. She didn't have to rap. She didn't have to rap. I don't want to upset you, but maybe you just need to tell us all why you told on Maria. Were you scared of going home or something? She pulled me away. She pulled away from me and gave me a look, a look, a look of doom that would have made the eagle proud. And I felt like she hated me or hated my question or both. And then she looked away, out the window, toward the soccer field, and said, "There's no home." Well, you have a family. I backpedaled. She talked to me about her mom just that morning. How could the girl who told that three how could the girl who told that joke three hours before become a sobbing mess 
still staring at me, she said. I try not to be scared, you know, but I still ruin everything. I still fuck up. Okay, I told her. It's okay. I didn't even know what she was talking about anymore. One vague notion after another. Don't you know who you love, Pudge? You love the girl who makes you laugh and shows you porn and drinks wine with you. You don't love the crazy, sullen bitch. And there was something to that, truth be told. And that is the end of that chapter. All right. I'm like, how much more do I want to read? Because it's getting pretty close. Okay, let me see. Oh shit, that's a long chapter. But I think I'll be able to read that. Okay, yes, I'll read that. Okay. The next chapter is called Christmas. We all went home for Christmas break. Even purportedly, purportedly homeless Alaska. I got a nice watch and a new wallet. Grown up, grown up gifts, my dad called them. But mostly I just studied for those two weeks. Christmas vacation wasn't really a vacation. None of a, uh, hold on. I just need to get more chapstick on my face. Mostly I just studied for those two weeks. Christmas vacation wasn't really a vacation, on account of how it was our last chance to study for exams, which started the day after we got back. I focused on pre-calc and biology, the, cl the two classes that most deeply threatened my goal of a 3.4 GPA. I wish I could say I was in it for the thrill of learning, but mostly I was in it for the thrill of getting into a worthwhile college. So yeah, I spent most of my time at home studying math and memorizing French vocab, just like I had before Culver Creek. Really, being at home for two weeks was just my entire life before Culver Creek, except my parents were more emotional. They talked very little about their trip to London. They felt, I think they felt guilty. And that's the funny thing about parents. Even though it's pretty, even though I pretty much stayed at the creek over Thanksgiving, because I wanted to. My parents still felt guilty. It's nice to have people who will feel guilty for you. Although, I could have lived without my mom crying during every single family dinner. She would say, I'm not a bad mother. And my dad and I would immediately reply, no, you're not. Even my dad, he was affectionate but not, like, sentimental. Randomly, while we were watching The Simpsons, said he missed me. And I miss, and I said I missed him too, and I did, sort of. They're such nice people. We went to movies and played card games, and I told them the stories I could tell them without horrifying them, and they listened. My dad, who sold real estate for a living, but read more books than anyone I knew, talked with me about the books I was reading for English class, and my mom insisted that I sit with her in the kitchen and learn how to make simple dishes, macaroni, scrambled eggs. Now that I was living on my own, now that I was living on my own. Never mind that I didn't have or want a kitchen. Never mind that I didn't like or, uh, never mind that I didn't like eggs or macaroni and cheese. By New Year's Day, I could make them, I could make them anyway. When I left, they both cried. My mom explaining that it was just my mom explaining that it was just empty nest empty ne nest syndrome that they were just so proud of me that they loved me so much that put a lump in my throat and I didn't care about Thanksgiving yet, and I didn't care about Thanksgiving anymore I had a family that was the end that is the end of that chapter.
now we're on to the chapter before Christmas was called 44 Days Before. This chapter is called Eight Days Before. So it really progresses a lot. Well, like Christmas came and all that, but like it really progresses. Okay. But yes. Excuse me. The next day is called Eight Days Before. Alaska walked in on the first day back from Christmas break and sat beside the Colonel on the couch. The Colonel was tired at work, breaking a land speed record on the PlayStation. She didn't say she missed us or that she was glad to see us. She just looked at the couch and said, you really need a new couch. Please don't address me when I'm racing, the colonel said. God, does Jeff Gordon have to put up with this shit? I've got an idea, she said. It's great. What we need is a free prank that coincides with an attack on Kevin and his minions, she said. I was sitting on the bed, reading the textbook in preparation for my history, for my American history exam the next day. A pre-prank? I asked. A prank designed to lull the am administration into a false sense of security. The colonel answered, annoyed by the destruction. After the pre-prank, the eagle will think the junior class has done its prank and won't be waiting for it and won't be waiting for it when it actually comes. Every year, the junior, the junior and senior classes pulled off a prank at some point in the year. Usually some something lame, like Roman candles. Something lame, like Roman candles in the dorm circle at 5 in the morning on a Sunday. Is there always a pre-prank? I asked. No, you idiot. The colonel said. If there was always a pre-prank, then the eagle would expect two pranks. The last time a pre-prank was used, hmm, oh right, 1987, when the pre-prank was cutting off electricity to campus, and then the actual prank was putting 500 live crickets in the heating, in the heating ducts of the classrooms. Sometimes you can still hear the chirping. Your rote memorization is like so impressive, they said. You guys are like an old married couple. Uh, Alaska smiled. In a creepy way. You don't know the half of it, the colonel said. You should see this kid try to crawl into bread with me at night. Hey! Let's get on, let's get on subject. Uh, Alaska said. Pre-prank. This weekend, since there's a new moon, we're staying at the barn. You, me, the Colonel, Tatumi, and as a special gift to you, Pudge, Laura Buderskaya. The Laura, the Laura Buderskaya I puked on? She's just shy. She still likes you. Uh, last laughed. Puking makes you look vulnerable. Very perky boobs, the Colonel said. Are you bringing Takumi for me? You need to be single for a t oh. You you need to be single for a while. True, true enough. The colonel said. Just spend a few more months playing video games, she said. The hand-eye coordination will come in handy when you get to third base. Gosh, I haven't heard that face system in so long. I think I've forgotten third... I think I've forgotten third base. The colonel responded. I would roll my eyes at you, but I can't afford to look away from the screen. French. Feel. Finger. Fuck. It's like you skipped third grade, Alaska said. 
I did skip third grade, the colonel answered. So I said, what's our pre break? The colonel and I will work on that. No need to get you in trouble. No need to get you into trouble. Yet. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to go for a cigarette then. I left. It wasn't the first time Alaska had left me out of the loop. Certainly, but after we'd been together for so, so much over Thanksgiving, it seemed ridiculous to plan a prank for the colonel, but without me. Hugh's t-shirts were, Hugh's t-shirts were wet with her tears. Mine. She would listen to her read Vonnegut. Me. Hugh'd been the butt of the world's worst knock-off, knock-off joke. Me. I walked to the sunny, I walked to the sunny convenience kiosk. Yeah, I walked to the sunny kiosk, uh, uh, I walked to the sunny convenience kiosk across the school and smoked. This never happened to me in Florida. This oh-so-high school angst about who likes who more, and I hated myself for letting it happen now. You don't have to care about her, I told myself. Screw her. And that is the end of that chapter. The next chapter is called 47, not 47, sorry, Four Days Before. The colonel wouldn't tell me a word about the, pre- the pre-prank, except that it would be called barn night, and that, and that when I packed, I should pack for two days. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday were torture. The colonel was always with Alaska, and I was never invited. So I spent an in, so I spent an inordinate amount of time studying for finals, which helped my GPA considerably. And I finally finished my religion paper. My answer to the question was straightforward enough, really. Most Christians and Muslims believe in a heaven and a hell, though there's a lot of disagreement between within both religions over what exactly will you get into yeah but yeah most most christians and muslims believe in a heaven and a hell though there's a lot of disagreement between within both religions over what exactly will get you into one afterlife or the other buddhists are more complicated because the buddha the buddhist doctrine of anatta which bas- which basically says that people don't have eternal souls instead they have a bundle of energy, and that bundle of, bundle of energy is transitory, migrating from one body to the ne- to the to another, reincarnating endlessly until it eventually reaches enlightenment. I never liked. I never liked writing concluding paragraphs to papers, where you just repeat what you just said with a phrase and with a phrase with phrases like in summation and to conclude. I didn't do that. Instead, I talked about why I thought it was an important question. People, I thought, wanted security. They couldn't bear the idea of death being big black nothing. Couldn't bear the idea of their loved ones not existing. And couldn't even imagine themselves not existing. I finally decided that people believed in an afterlife because they couldn't bear not to. That is the end of that chapter. And this chapter is called three days before. On Friday, after a surprisingly successful pre-cap exam that brought my first set of Clover Creek finals to a close, I packed clothes. Think New York trendy, the colonel advised. Think black, think sensible, comfortable but warm. And my sleeping bag, and my sleeping bag into a backpack and we picked up Takumi in his room and walked to the eagle's house. The eagle was wearing his only outfit, and I wondered whether he had 30 identical white button-down shirts and 30 identical black ties in his closet. I pictured him waking up in the morning, staring at his closet and thinking, hmm, hmm, how about a white shirt and a black tie? Talk about a guy who could use a wife.
I'm taking Miles and Takumi home for the weekend. It's a new hope. Yeah, I'm taking Miles and Takumi home for the weekend to new hope, the colonel said. Miles liked his taste of new hope that much. Yeah, Miles liked his taste of new hope that much? The eagle asked me. Yeehaw! There's gonna be a hoe down at the trailer park, uh, the colonel said. He could actually have a southern action accent when he wanted to. Although, like most everyone at Culver Creek, he usually, he didn't usually speak with one. Hold on one moment while I call your mom, the eagle said to the, to the colonel. Takumi looked at me with poorly disguised panic, and I felt lunch, fried chicken, rising up, rising in my stomach. But the colonel just smiled. Sure thing. Chip and Miles and Takumi will be at your house this weekend? Yes, ma'am. Huh. Okay. Bye now. The eagle looked up at the colonel. Your mom is a wonderful woman. The, the eagle smiled. You're telling me. The colonel grinned. See you on Sunday. As we walked toward the gym parking lot, the colonel said, I called her yesterday and asked her to cover for me, and she didn't even ask why. She just said, I sure trust you, son, and hot damn she does. Once out of sight of the eagle's house, we took a sharp right into the woods. We walked on a dirt road over the bridge and back to the school barn, a dilapidated creek prone structure that looked more like a that looked more like a long abandoned log cabin than a barn. They still stored hay there, although I didn't know what for. It wasn't like we had an equestrian program or some or anything. The Colonel, the Kumi and I got there first, setting up our sleeping bags on the softest on the softest bales of hay. It was six thirty. Alaska came uh, excuse me. Alaska came shortly after, having told the eagle she was spending the weekend with Drake. The eagle didn't check check that story, because as, uh, because Alaska spent at least one weekend there every month, and he knew that her parents never cared. Laura showed up half an hour later. She told the eagle she was driving to Atlanta to see an old friend from Romania. The eagle called Laura's parents to make sure that they knew she was spending a weekend off campus, and they didn't mind. They trust me, she smiled. You don't sound like you have an a you don't sound like you have an accent sometimes. I said, which is pretty stupid, but which was pretty stupid, but a darn sight better than throwing up on her. Eats only soft eyes. Eats only soft eyes. No soft eyes in Russian? I asked. Romanian, she corrected me. Turns out Romanian is a language. Who knew? My cultural sensitivity quotient was going to have to drastically increase if I was going to share a sleeping bag with Laura, with Laura anytime soon. Everybody was sitting on sleeping bags, Alaska smoking with flagrant disregard for the overwhelming flammability of the structure, when the colonel pulled out a single piece of computer paper and read from it. The point of this evening's festivities is to prove once and for all that we are to pranking that, er, let me see. The point of this evening's festivities is to prove once and for all that we are to pranking for, let me say that again. I think I'm just like not reading it fully. Yeah, the point of this evening's festivities is to prove once and for all that we are to pranking what the weekday warriors are to sucking. But we'll have but we'll also have the opportunity 
to make life unpleasant for the eagle, which is always a welcome pleasure. And so, he said, pausing as if for a drum roll, we fight tonight a battle on three, on three fronts. Front one, the prey prank. We will, as it were, light a fire under the eagle's ass. Front two, Operation Baldy, wherein Laura flies solo in a retaliatory mission so elegant and cruel that it could be that it could only have so elegant so elegant and cruel that it could only have been the brain that it could only have been the brainchild of well me. Hey Alaska interrupted. It was my idea. Okay, fine, it was Alaska's idea. He laughed. And finally, front three, the progress reports. We're going to hack into the faculty computer network and use their grading database to send out letters to Kevin's et, to Kevin et al's families saying that they are failing some of their classes. We are definitely going to get expelled, I said. I hope you didn't bring the Asian kid along thinking he's a computer genius, because I am not, Takumi said. We're not going to get expelled, and I'm the computer genius. The rest of you are muscle and distraction. We won't get expelled even if we get caught, because there are no expellable offenses here. Well, except for the five bottles of Strawberry Hill and Alaska's backpack, but that will be well hidden. We're just, you know, wreaking a little habit. The plan was laid out, and it left no room for error. The colonel replied so heavily on perfect syn synchron Hold on. I know how to read this word, but I don't know how to say this word. Synchronicity. Okay. It's like, what? How is this word pronounced? Synchronicity. God damn it. I have like the memory of like a fucking fly. Synchronicity. Synchronicity. The plan was laid out, and it left no room for error. The Colonel heavily, the Colonel relied so heavily on perfect synchronicity, synchronicity, yeah, relied so heavily on perfect synchronicity that if one of us messed up even slightly, the endeavor would collapse entirely. He had printed up individual itineraries for, e for each of us, including times exact to the second. Our watches synchronized, our clothes black, our backpacks on. Our breath visible in the cold, our minds filled with the minute, with the minute. <sighs> our minds filled with the minute details of the plan, our hearts racing. We walked out of the barn together once it was completely dark. The five of us maybe the five of us walking confidently in a row. I've never felt cooler. The crate perhaps was upon us, and we were invincible. The plan may have had faults, but we did not. After five minutes, we split up to go to our destinations. I stuck with Takumi. We were the distractions. We are the fucking Marines, he said. First to fight, first to die. I agreed nervously. Hell yes. He stopped and opened his back. Not here, dude, I said. We have to go to the Eagles. I know, I know, just hold on. He pulled out a thick headband. It was brown, 
with a plush fox head on front. He put it on his head. I laughed. What the hell is that for? It's my fox hat. Your fox hat? Yeah, Pudge. My fox hat. Why are you wearing your fox hat? I said, I asked. Because no one can catch a motherfucking fox. Two minutes later, we were crouched behind the trees, 50 feet from the colonel's back door. My heart thumped like a techno beat drum. Uh, my, yeah, my heart, my heart thumped like a techno drum beat. 30 seconds, Takumi whispered, and I felt the same spooked nervousness that I felt that first night with Alaska when she grabbed my hand and whispered, run, 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 run. But I stayed put. I thought, we are not close enough. I thought, he will not hear it. I thought, he will hear it and be out so fast that we will have no chance. I thought, 20 seconds. I was breathing hard and fast. Hey, Pudge, Takumi whispered. You can do this, dude. It's just running. Right, just running. My knees are good. My legs are fair. It's just running. Five, he said. Four, three, two, one. Light it, light it, light it! It lit with a sizzle that reminded me of every fourth, uh, that reminded me of every July 4th with my family. We stood still for a nanosecond, staring at the fuse and making sure it was lit. And now, and now, I thought, now, run, 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 run. But my, body, but my body didn't move until I heard Takumi shout whisper, Go, go, go! Fucking go! And we went. Three seconds later, a huge burst of pops. It sounded to me like an automatic gunfire in decapitation, except louder. We were 20 steps away already, and I thought my eardrums would burst. I thought, well... He will certainly hear it. We ran past the we ran past the soccer field and into the woods, running uphill and with only the vaguest sense of direction. In the dark, fallen branches and moss-covered rocks appeared at the last possible second. Uh, let me say that again. In the dark, fallen branches and moss-covered rocks appeared at the last possible second, and I slipped and fell repeatedly and worried that the eagle would catch up, but I was just getting, but I was just getting up and running beside the Kumi, away from the classrooms in the dorm circle. We ran like we had golden shoes. I ran like a cheetah, well, like a cheetah that smoked too much, and then, after precisely one minute of running, Takumi stopped and ripped, op and ripped open his bag. My, my turn to count down. Staring at my watch, terrified, by now he was surely out. He was surely running. I wondered if he was fast. I wondered if he was fast. He was old, but he'd be mad. Five, four, three, two, one. And the sizzle. We didn't pause that time. We just ran. Still west. Breathe. Breathe heaving, breath, breath heaving. I wondered if I could do this for 30 minutes. The firecrackers exploded. The pops ended and a voice cried out, Stop right now! But we did not stop. Stopping was not in the plan. I'm the motherfucking fox! Takumi whispered, both to himself and to me. No one can catch the fox. A minute later, I was on the ground. Takumi counted. The fuse lit. We ran. But it was a dud. We prepared for one dud. We had prepared for one dud, bringing an extra string of firecrackers. Another, though, would cost the colonel in Alaska a minute. Takumi crouched down. Yeah, Takumi crouched down to the ground, lit, lit the fuse, and ran. The popping started. The fireworks bang, bang, banged in sync with my heart. When the firecrackers finished, I heard, 
Stop or I'll call the police. And though the sound was and though the voice was distant, I could feel his lack I could feel his look of doom bearing down on me. The pigs can't stop the fox. I'm too quick. Uh Tukumi said to himself. I can rhyme while I'll run, I'm that slip. The colonel warned us that the police the colonel warned us about the police threat, told us not to worry. The eagle didn't like to bring the police to campus. Bad publicity. So we ran, over and under, and through all manner of trees and bushes and branches. We fell, we got up, we ran. If he couldn't follow us with the firecrackers, he sure he could sure as hell follow follow the sound of our whispered shits as we tripped over dead logs and fell into briar bushes. One minute, I knelt down, let the fuse, ran, bang. Then we turned north, thinking we'd gotten past the lake. This was key to the plan. The further we got while staying on campus, the further the eagle would follow us. The farther he followed us, the farther he would be from the classrooms where the colonel and Alaska were working their magic. And then we planned to loop back in the classrooms and swing east along the creek until we came over to the bridge, until we came to the bridge over our smoking hole, where we would rejoin the road and walk back to the barn, triumphant. But here's the thing. We made a slight error in navigation. We weren't past the lake. Instead, we were staring at the field and then, and then the lake. Too close to the classrooms to run anywhere, but along the lakefront. I looked over at Takumi, who was running with me in stride for stride, and he just said, Drop one now. So I dropped one, lit the fuse, and we ran. We were running through a clearing now, and if the eagle was behind us, he could see us. We got to the south corner of the lake and started running along the shore. The lake wasn't all that big, maybe a quarter mile long, so we didn't have, so we didn't have far to go. When I, so we didn't have far to go when I saw it, the swan. Swimming toward us like, swimming toward us like a swan possessed, wings flapping furiously as it came, and then when it was on shore in front of us making a noise that sounded like nothing else in this world, like all the worst parts of a dying rabbit, plus all the worst parts of a baby, of a crying baby. And there was no other way, so we just ran. I hit the swan at full run, and felt it bite into my ass. Then, and then I was running with a noticeable limp, because my ass was on fire, and I thought to myself, what the hell is in swan saliva that burns so badly? The 23rd string was a dud, costing us a minute. At that point, I wanted a minute. I was dying. The burning sensation in my left buttock had doled, had doled into an intense aching, magnified each time I landed on my left leg. So I was running like an injured gazelle trying to evade a pride of lions. Our speed, needless to say, had slowed down considerably. We hadn't heard the eagle since we got across the lake, but I didn't think he tried, he had turned around. <clears throat> yeah, we hadn't heard the eagle since we got across the lake. <sighs> but I didn't think he had turned around. He was just, he was trying to lull us into complacency, but it would not work. Tonight, we were invincible. Exhausted, we stopped with three strings left and hoped we'd given the colonel enough time. We ran for a few more minutes until we found the bank of the creek. Until we found the bank of the creek. It was so dark and so still that the tiny stream of water... It was so dark and so still that the tiny, the tiny stream of water seemed to roar. But I could only... But I could still hear our hard fast breaths as we clapped, as we clasped on wet clay and pebbles inside the creek. Only when we stopped did I look at Takumi. His face and arms were scratched. 
the fox head now directly over his left ear. Looking at my own arms, I noticed blood dripping from the deeper cuts. There were, I remembered now, some wicked briar patches, but I was feeling no pain. Takumi picked out thorn, picked thorns out of his leg. The fox is fucking tired, he said and laughed. The swan bit my ass, I told him. I saw, he smiled. Is it bleeding? I reached my hand into my pants to check. No blood, so I spoke to celebrate. Mission accomplished, I said. Pudge, my friend, we are in the fucking structable. We couldn't figure out where we were, where we were because the creek doubles back so many times throughout the compass. So we followed the creek for about 10 minutes, figuring we walked Figuring we walked half as fast as we ran, and then turned left. Left, you think? Takumi said. Takumi asked. I'm pretty lost, I said. The fox is pointing left, so left. And sure enough, the fox took us right back to the barn. You're okay, Laura said, Laura said as we walked up. I was worried. I saw the eagle run out of out of his house. He was wearing pajamas. He sure looked mad. I looked. I, uh, I said, well, if he was mad then, I wouldn't want to see him now. What took you so long? Uh, she, she asked. We took the long way home, Takumi said. Plus, Pudge is walking like an old lady with hemorrhoids because the swan bit him on the ass. Where's Alaska and the colonel? I don't know. Laura, Laura said, and then we heard footsteps in the distance, muttering and cracking branches. In a flash, Takumi grabbed our sleeping bags and backpacks and hid them behind the pails of hay. The three of us ran through the back of the barn and into the waist high grass, and into the waist high grass, <clears throat> and lay down. <coughs> Hold on, I need to drink some water. Fuck you. <coughs> uh, <coughs> there we go. Three of, yeah, the three of us ran through the back of the barn and into the waste high grass and laid down. He tracked us down to the barn, I thought. We fucked everything up. And then I heard the colonel's voice, distinct but and very annoyed, say, because it's narrows because it narrows the list of possible suspects by twenty-three. Why couldn't you just follow the plan? Christ, where is everybody? We walked back to the barn, a bit sheepish for having overreacted. The colonel sat down on a pail of hay his elbows on his knees, his head bowed, his palms against his forehead, thinking. Well, we haven't been caught yet anyway. Okay, first, he said, without looking up. Tell me everything else went all right, Laura. Yeah, tell me everything else went all right, Laura. She started talking. Yes, good. Can I have some more details, please? Can I have some more detail, please? I did, I did like your paper, I did like your paper said. I stayed with the e I stayed behind the eagle's house until I saw him run after Miles and Takumi. And then I ran behind the dorms. And then I went through the window into, into Kevin, Kevin's, into Kevin's room. Then I put the stuff in the gel and the conditioner. And then I did the same thing in Jif and Longwell and Longwell's room. The stuff? I asked. Undiluted industrial strength blue number five hair dye. Alaska said. 
which I bought with your cigarette money. Apply it to wet hair, and it won't wash out for months. We dyed their hair blue? Well, technically, the colonel said, but still speaking into his lap. They're going to dye their own hair blue, but we have certainly made it easier for them. I know you and Takumi did all right, because we're here, and you're here, and you did your job. The good news is that the three assholes who had the gall to prank us have progress reports coming saying they are filling three classes. Uh-oh. What's the bad news? Uh, Loris asked. Oh, come on, Alaska said. The other good news is that while the colonel was worried he'd heard something and ran into the woods, I saw to it that 20 other weekday warriors also have progress reports coming. I printed out pro I printed out reports for all of them, stuffed them into mirrored school envelopes, and put them in the mailbox. She turned to the colonel. You were sure gone a long time. You were sure gone. You were sure gone a long time, she said. The little, the little colonel, so scared of getting expelled. The colonel stood up, towering over the rest of us as we sat. That is not good news. That was not the plan. That means there are twenty-three people who the eagle can eliminate as as suspects. Twenty-three people who might figure out it was us and wrap. If that happens, if that happens, yeah, if that happens, Alessa said very seriously, I'll take the fall. Right, the colonel said, like you took the fall for Paul and Maria. You'll say that while you're trapezing through the room, you'll say that while you were trapezing through the woods, lighting firecrackers, you were simultaneously hacking into the faculty network and printing out false report, progress reports in school and school stationery because I'm sure that will fly with the eagle. Relax, dude, Takumi said. First off, we're not going to get caught. Second off, if we do, I'll take the fall with Alaska. You've got more to lose than any of us. The colonel just nodded. It was an undeniable fact. The colonel would have no chance to add a scholarship to a good school if he got expelled from the creek. Knowing that nothing cheered up the colonel, the colonel uh, like acknowledging his brilliance, I asked, "So how'd you hack the, so how'd you hack the network?" I climbed into the win, I climbed in the window of Doctor Hyde's office, booted up his computer, and I typed in his password. He said, smiling. You guessed it? You guessed it? No. On Tuesday, I went to his office and asked him to print me a copy of the recommended list. And asked him to print me a copy of the recommended reading. And then I watched him type the password. J3CKYLNH. YD3. Well, shit, Takumi said. I could have done that. Sure, but then you wouldn't have gotten to wear that sexy hat, the colonel said, laughing. Takumi took the headband, Takumi took the headband off and put it in his bag. Kevin is going to be pissed about his hair, I said. Yeah, well, I'm really pissed about my waterlogged library. Kevin is a blow-up doll, uh, Alaska said. Prick us, we bleed. Prick him, he pops. It's true, said Takumi. The guy is a dick. He kind of tried to kill you, after all. Yeah, I guess, I acknowledged. There are a lot of people like that, Alaska went on, still fuming. You know what? You know... Fuck blow-up doll rich kids. But even though Kevin had sort of tried to kill me and all, he didn't really, he really didn't seem worth hating. Hating the cool kids 
takes an awful lot of energy, and I'd given up on it a long time ago. For me, the prank was just a response to a previous prank, just a golden opportunity to, as the colonel said, wreak a little, a little havoc. But to Alaska, it seemed to be something else, something more. I wanted to ask her about it, but she lay back down behind the pile of hay, invisible again. Alaska was done talking, and when she was done talking, that was it. We didn't coax her out for two hours until the colonel unscrewed a bottle of wine. <sighs> we passed around the bottle till I could feel it in my stomach, sour and warm. I wanted to like booze more than I actually did, which is more or less the precise opposite of how I felt about it. Which is more or less the precise opposite of how I felt about Alaska. But that night, the booze felt great as the warmth of the wine on my stomach spread through my body. I didn't feel stupid or out of control, but I liked the way it made everything, laughing, crying, peeing in front of your friends, easier. Why didn't we drink? Uh, why did we drink? Yeah, why did we drink? For me, it was just for fun, particularly because we were risking expulsion. The nice thing about the constant threat of expulsion at Culver Creek is that it lends excitement to every moment of illicit pleasure. The bad thing, of course, is that there is always the possibility of actual expulsion. Okay. That is the end of that chapter. Um, and that is the end for me today. Okay. Well, thank you so much for listening. And I will see you, I guess, in the next video. Bye-bye.